church day. Um, as I mentioned this morning, the mission of this week's conference is the same um, as at our Boston Spring events. We want applied learning through networking and education. So I hope today delivered on that promise for you all. We started this morning with our opening keynote, Richard Law from Accenture. Um, he spoke about AI first, way of re-engineering drug discovery process of focusing on drug discovery as a learning problem, not a big data or a screening problem. Um, and so we're gonna end day one with another important topic related to biomedical research data strategies given by Felipe Mark from Novartis. But introducing Felipe um, and the plenary keynote session is Anise Carve, Anish, I'm sorry, Carve, CTO of Quilt Data. So Anish, kick us off. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. I have a very special connection with the city. I first came here in 2007 as a student, and now I'm back to speak to you as a practitioner. And what I'd like to spend a few minutes talking to you about is the human dimension of, of FAIR data. And I think one of the things that is difficult for us is that FAIR really, at the end of the day, is a destination, but it doesn't always tell teams how to get there. And there's a quote, if you remember, there's a very famous technology blog run by Walt Mossberg of the Wall Street Journal. And his very first article started with, personal computers are just too hard to use and it isn't your fault. And this is one of the emotional dimensions of FAIR that I wanna introduce is that FAIR being a destination and not a methodology for getting there, it many times feels intimidating to teams. And as I think back through the variety of biopharma customers that we worked with over the past three years, I really feel that a lot of them would more describe their data as foul than they would fair. And these are all the things we're all familiar with, fragmented, overwhelming, uncertain, and lost. And the importance of really acknowledging this delta between where we are as a company and where we'd like to go is that in order to achieve fair data, we need a new mental model as an industry. And so with that, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about some of the initiatives we're pursuing in the open source to make FAIR data or to make this transition from foul data to FAIR data easier and more practical for teams. How many people are familiar with the concept of containerization in software? Great, I think most of the room. And the key idea here, we've got the visual of containers, of course, shipping around the world was revolutionized when containers became standardized. And a shipping container doesn't care if you put automotive parts or you put toys in it or you put electronics. It really makes no difference whatsoever. And the thing that I find is the biggest single challenge in biopharma is a variety of different structures, semi-structured, unstructured, structured data, and a variety of different use cases. And so what I'd like to introduce is this concept we've been pursuing in the open source of a, of a standard data container. And data containers should have these five characteristics, uh, immutable, human readable, structure agnostic, logical, and validated. And I'm using that term validated in the context of GXP environments. So you can all check us out on the open source. Uh, we are github.com slash quilt data slash quilt. And again, this is a completely royalty free API. And I want to state that data is such a personal asset for biopharmas that open source is the only way we're gonna to come to a standard container that works for everybody. So these APIs need to be completely royalty free, number one, and they need to be open file formats that give you, the user, control of the data in your own cloud. A few comments here on the dimensions of containers, data containers that we found to be important. So the first is that this concept of immutability makes iteration and compliance easier. And it seems like those two things would be at odds, but I wanna talk about why that is. So as scientists, we like to tweak, 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 and modify things. And we've come from a generation where, whoa, the computers are in charge of the data, and nobody should modify anything because who knows what the downstream effects will be. So the security, really psychological safety is what immutable data provides. Because I know as a scientist, if I grab an immutable data set and I modify it, that I can always return it to its original condition. So the importance of immutability is to make this concept of experimenting or branching or tweaking cheap. 
And then the second thing is that an immutable data container, the data should be continuously checksummed or validated for GXP environments. We'll talk more about that. And the key idea here is that you want to build science in one sentence, or biopharma in one sentence, is that we want to go from instrument to scientist to filing, and we want to do that with a continuous data chain of custody. And that's what immutability allows you to do. I think the second insight really is that different levels of structure of data can be unified into a single container. And the insight here, how many people are familiar with Amazon Web Services or have used Amazon S3? So the, both the, the agony and the ecstasy of S3 is that it will accommodate any structure of data. And in biopharma, we see highly heterogeneous data sets. It's totally likely that we could have a, a large FASTQ an Excel file, some images, all in the same data set. We could have some JSON metadata. So any level of structure can be found in the same data set. And the beauty of blob storage is that it includes or incorporates all these levels of structure. And of course, blob storage, or S3 at least, supports object versioning, but not collection versioning. So this is really, again, the importance of this concept of a data agnostic container for biopharma. The next pressure, which I'd like to take off your shoulders in terms of fair and foul data, is that you don't have to know the schemas of your data ahead of time. And as I talk to teams around the world, this creates a tremendous amount of pressure on teams. And they feel like they have to interview the whole company and find out what the one schema is that works for everybody. And the truth of the matter is, again, because especially at the discovery phase, data is so heterogeneous, you're never going to find a single schema for everyone. And so we've really tried to socialize this idea that instead of being planned, schemas can be discovered in a bottoms up way. And the significance here, if you can think of at the top of the data warehouse are the databases. And if we go from the database down to the users, we're going to spend a long time interviewing and discovering types. But if we start at the bottom, if we start from the files and let users gradually harden up the schemas over time with a data life cycle, things become much easier. And this is one of the innovations that we've been able to do, introduce, again, in the open source, this gradual schema hardening, where you don't commingle all of your data, but you start with raw data from instruments, you go to refined data where it's under analysis, and then finally curated data. These are candidates for investigation that are interesting, or maybe will go on even into your, your ID filings. A little bit more, how many people have used, or are at companies that, that use folders to store data? So maybe Box, maybe Dropbox, maybe S3, maybe Ignite. Okay, I think it's pretty much all of us. And there's a, a key weakness of folders, and I, I call this the, the tyranny of files and folders. And the main thing is the name of the folder has no necessary relationship with the contents of the data. And if you think about a validated chain of custody for something like a GXP environment, it's a real problem that data can be moved, data can be modified, and the folder is none the wiser. The other problem is that there's no single hierarchy that works for everybody. If you go scientist slash department, then it's going to be really difficult to find all the work under a given department and vice versa. And we're introducing, in, again in the open source, this concept of logical URIs. So if you look on the far right there, you'll see at the very, very end of that URI, and the URI combines both a logical name and a location or a virtualized location, you'll see that hash. And the significance here is that when we start to use URIs, you cannot change the name of something without also changing the contents. And this is the key realization for storage in biopharma is you want the contents to be intimately tied to the name with cryptographic certainty. So that hash is really a cryptographic, a SHA-256 hash of all the contents of the data set. And if the contents change, then the hash must change and vice versa. And this level of certainty is extraordinarily important, again, for your IND filings. The last point I want to talk to you about is human readability. And one of the hardest problems in biopharma is getting wet science teams and dry science teams to collaborate and talk to one another. One of the reasons is dry scientists are continuously running experiments in the cloud. And wet scientists are not really always comfortable with the abstruse and different types of software. They're not going to go into Amazon S3. They're not going to write code to access the data. And so what we really want to do with this biopharma container is create a unified, self-evident format that includes data, metadata, charts, documentation, and lineage. I've got a few examples here, which you're welcome to pull up after the talk. And the key thing on the right there, we see the data, 
we see the lineage of the data, and then visualizations like IGV, like Vega, like Altair should be very easy for us to produce so that not only machines, but also people can verify and understand the contents of the data. Because until people agree, data isn't really data. And finally, just a few heuristics to end for you with uh, questions every data set must answer in order to be self-evident. Where did the data come from? Why should I trust this data? And how do I use this data? We're very easy to find if you have questions for us. We're Quilt Data on Twitter, or send us an email, or visit us on quiltdata.com. And with that, I just had a very pleasant conversation with my colleague, Philippe Marc, over here. And I encourage you to listen very closely to what Philippe has to say, because he has been on the journey that many of us smaller companies are now just beginning. And the real beauty of, of hearing and learning from Philippe's story is that this is how science functions at scale. So Philippe is executive director and global head of integrated data science at the Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research, NIBR. And to just give you a little bit of teaser of what he's gonna talk about, there are four pillars of the data management strategy at NIBR, and they are data culture. We just had a really interesting chat about how that works in the remote world. Data management, data science, and data enterprise. And with that, I want to hand things over to Philippe, and he's going to be talking to you about NIBR's data strategy. Thank you so much. That was great. Thanks for the introduction. Actually, it's, uh, well, fair and full. Yeah, well done. Okay, so I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the data journey at uh, Niebuhr, so the research at Novartis. Uh, we just went through, um, well, a real journey actually to try to define what are the, the basic things that we need to do and where we need to act. And I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, an overview of that. Um, first thing, so what is Niebuhr? Uh, it's the research organization of Novartis. Um, 6,000 people roughly, plus of course all the partners on the ecosystem, many of you being in the room today. Um, we are having a large pipeline, too large if you're asking, <laughs> I think we, we have a problem with that. Um, and the big deal is that we are spending 2.6 billion a year into creation of data, um, which is uh, one quarter of the R&D budget of Novartis. So, R alone is 2.6 billion. I would argue that data is actually what we produce at the end. That's the only goal of research. At the end, what you want is going to be something that is going to cure, not the product itself, the way to get that product done. You want to be convinced about the safety and the efficacy. It's the data package that we will format to submit to the FDA, EMA, PMDA, other health authorities, and probably will have secured some IP, some intellectual product, product, uh, protection, sorry, in that journey. So at the end of the day, these 2.6 billions are going into creation of data, data on data, and that's the final product. And for the small, uh, well, the little story, if you look on the web, you will find a talk from me at the BioIT World in Boston in 2011, where I was arguing about that, actually. I had several slides about that already. 11 years later, a few new titles later, now a data scientist, was not yet at that time. The, um, I would argue that it's still really the case. So we need to have this data under control. It's really our core business in research. Why is the question, of course. Um, well, simply because they're everywhere. So the data are created for decision making, usually. You just want to create the data that are going to solve your question. On them, sometimes you will want to agglomerate more data to get larger questions addressed, or you will want to look at the past to be able to understand what you are seeing today and what is the meaning of what you are seeing. The perfect example being the toxicology. If you see an effect, you want to know if you have seen it before. If you did see it before, you will want to know how you did address that. Is it the death of my compound? Is it something that someone has seen in the industry before? If it was there, how to mitigate that problem? Is it still possible to develop? On them, you see here a lot of things that are related to what is called AI now. 
So that's more the machine learning on the big ag aggregation of data that, uh, that we plotted on that, uh, that slide. And you can see that it's really everywhere. And of course, these activities will need to have clean data. Otherwise, you can't get there. Of course, so we need a data strategy. What is that beast? Um, so first thing, um, everybody is dealing with data every day, meaning that it's not like we have been doing nothing for 20 years, and then we wake up, hey, we need a data strategy. Things are already running everywhere, at Novartis, externally, everywhere. So the question is, what, why do we need that? So first, we need a North Star. We need to know the direction. That's a strategy. Uh, that seems like a stupid thing to say, but actually, uh, in a large company, you know, people are running everywhere, and when you drop AI in the thing, people are running even more crazy. Uh, you want also to make sure that uh, you have a way to aggregate the projects, a new home for this project, that you have an overview, which means that you can identify the gaps that exist. And while that's, well, all the companies have been, doing, have been doing that the recent years, what are the gaps in my data, specifically in the context of the large aggregation? on the AI concept. And at the end, it's really about that community, forming that community behind something that is uh, unifying all that. So what does it look like? Um, so we did end up with one document, which was endorsed by the head of uh, Niebuhr, uh, Jay Bratner. And actually, uh, so that was uh, well, in Q4 last year. And he told me, well, by the way, it's pre-competitive. Go out, publish that. OK, Jay. Well, and that's why I'm here today, because, well, the, the idea is that it can be used by others. It's very much in the spirit of Niebuhr right now, and Jay, of course. We still have our president for the next two weeks. Then he will pass over to someone else, and we'll have a new chapter after seven years with Jay. But it's really the, the spirit to exchange. So if you want to discuss later, I'm really very happy to discuss with people and try to help uh, to share the ideas that we have. Maybe not always the best one in the world, but that's what we are doing. In terms of what that data strategy here. So, is. So four pillars, I just, you just heard, data culture, data management, data science, data enterprise, which may be more the surprise for people. And I'm going to give you a little bit of what it means with some highlights in a, in a few seconds. It was derived to a document which is centrally accessible. So you, we have a, a way to access all our concepts with just a tiny URL. So we put tiny URL slash, well, the name of our tiny URL slash liber data strategy and you get 20 pages coming to you. It went up to a place where I thought we'll end up at 70 pages, and then while someone wise said, well, there is no way people will read, will read that, make it short. And 20 pages is, is actually a, so, um, a soft thing because you have basically an executive summary, which is a one-pager, and then you have different things that you can read in the details or not. And so far, we have 53 projects that are attached to that, uh, that thing, I will come back to that. The implementation is another world. Yeah, I'm going to discuss the strategy, but of course the strategy is nothing, nothing on nothing if you don't act on it. And the implementation is a really another story. Okay, so let's see what we get here. Data culture, yeah. So we derive for each of the pillars some key things that we want to do. I'm not sure you are able to read them. Yes, too bad if you're in the back. Well, yeah, I see that you're shaking hands, but... <laughs> well, okay, so uh, basically we, we derive some, uh, some things, and you can see that it's inspired by the FAIR principle, where you also have numbers and all that. Um, so data culture is about uh, communication. We want people to know it exists, we want people to align, to understand why we are doing that, and I would argue that it's one of the hardest bits to get. Um, the DC2, the second point here, is saying that we want to have common goals for each department in Niebuhr to put goals to people around that. So that's not yet the case. I hope that it will come next year. Uh, the discussions are not easy, to be honest, because, well, first we have a new president of Niebuhr coming, so we don't know what she will want exactly, so we'll have to, uh, to align. And then when we, we discuss with some, um, some of the theoretical areas, or these areas, well, some people are not really in that space yet. Some people are a little bit, yes, well, what is the return of investment for me? And I'm coming back to that in few, uh, well, in the next pillar, actually. Um, so it's a difficult one. The culture, it's about uh, 
training. Of course, there is all the compliance, regulation, data governance. These ones are granted. Uh, I expect uh, all of the companies to have programs in place. But there is really that breaking the silos, like the data are not my data, they are the company data. And we still see some people, well, Novartis is not too prevalent, but to be honest, having been in the three big pharma companies, you see some places where people do not want to share their data. And there you are, well, what's going on there? So there are, that's all part of the culture. Uh, on that journey, if you want to have the culture to be understood, you need to write what that is. And a, a clear example of that, tip of the iceberg, are the data governances. So data retention, data governance, who can see what, and why, well, by default it should be open, uh, need to know basis, uh, you should be able to see everything. If you don't, there, there is a need to explain why. So that data culture is really going to keep us busy a few years, I think. Uh, things are ongoing, uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a difficult one. And I'm sure yet you will all agree on that one. Another one which is technical, and many people here are discussing this, uh, these things these days, uh, are, well, of course, all the things around data management. Um, the, the main goal is to be able to get the data to be non-obstructive to decision making. So that's the first goal here. To be honest, that one should already be there. If you are not there, the gap is probably already identified, uh, because, well, that's, uh, well, that's what we are doing in our daily job. Everybody is producing data, everybody is trying to decide, everybody is trying to decide where to go. If the data production is too hard, usually that's popping up in the, in the, the system and we're trying to solve that. That being said, I could mention a few of them at Novartis, which are really still painful. So we're working on that. Um, but I think the two main topics here that are the, the most, uh, well, the one that we need to discuss in such a meeting are the two last points here. So the DM4, or Data Management 4, is about the fair play, the creation of data to be fair by at its inception. You want to get the data to be already fair when you create them, because, well, it's cheaper at the end. The problem there is, well, fair, yes, but fair enough. I don't want to be fair. No one wants to be fair, by the way. It's way too complex, way too hard, and by definition, you will not be able to to tick all the boxes, by the way. If you read back the definition, uh, that's just not doable. So the question here is fair enough, what does it mean? And that one is uh, for, uh, perfect for the apero, for a discussion. Uh, it's really hard to define uh, what is the limit. You want your data to, be, uh, to exist with the right metadata, to be able to find, to be able to integrate, that's pretty clear. You certainly want to have a central URI, that's pretty clear. You probably want to have APIs, and that one will be debated already, and, well, and so on and so on. So the message here is fair play, try to really make the data fair, but be careful, fair means, well, we use fair as a proxy to data that are usable for what we want to do. It doesn't need to be fair by the, the cookbook of the fair plus, or any other metric. And then the last one here is uh, another challenge, so the M5, it's about verification. So curation of data, basically. I have a set of data from the past, legacy, well, or brand new, by the way, that I just acquired from another company that I just bought from uh, whoever, and I want to use it on them. Ah, bad news, it's not that clean. What do I do on that verification? And what is said here is that we'll curate this data only, and only if it's a competitive advantage for the company. Why is that? Because with the, the explosion of AI, we have seen many people who went crazy about curation of data. Uh, small data sets in corners, big data sets globally for the company. Uh, we went through all the hype cycle of the AI, of course, with uh, uh, great things. We had really uh, good people coming and uh, uh, with uh, our CDO office and doing a lot of good things. But we have seen also many things where verification was a cost and did not bring any benefit. So that one needs to be discussed. There was a beautiful talk today about Fair Plus on the Fair Decide on, uh, that will be published now, I heard today, in Drug Discovery, I think. And well, that's things that you need to pay attention to. The question is, okay, should I curate my data or not? Don't do it if you don't know why. Not a good idea. And well, I hope that that one, that's a piece, well, these two, about the Fair Play, which was already there. Everybody was convinced that we should create the data fair. 
on that verification curation that should be done only if it's interesting, I hope that these points are going to resonate with you, but also that they will be applied at Nibber. That one, I'm okay to re-battle on these ones, because I've really seen people spending way too much time on curation. And I like that, I did ma many curation projects myself, but well, you should think before doing them. Of course, data management is also all the pure data management, the enterprise data management and all that. I will rediscuss that in the data enterprise pillar. The third one is the data science, and we are going to think algorithms and fun funky things. We start with a very basic thing. Uh, can we have a search that works to find our things at the level of the research or even Novartis as a whole? Um, basically, we want to enable scientists to find data sets, of course, but also knowledge, more important than data, data sets, the knowledge that was created, but also SMEs, subject matter experts, and of course, uh, the tools that exist. At Novartis, we have so many tools that it's hard to find them. <laughs> we reach that stage where we are lost crawling into systems. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to organize all that. And that strategy, I hope, will, uh, will help to put uh, a cap on the number of systems, which will al always uh, help our IT organization also to have less to do because, well, we are doing too many in, the, in that place. On them, well, that's uh, a lot about uh, making sure that we understand what are the priority lists, and that's linked to the verification also. So where are the places where we can operate today with data science? What are the key things that we should do? Data science like algorithms, machine learning, AI, but also the curation, the verification of the data management topic. That's where it's plugged. That's where you can see if there is a value or not. And then another one um, uh, that is mentioned here is uh, the take concrete action on the unmet uh, needs. And um, that one is, uh, well, there is a, a full paper about that, so it's a little bit abstract set that, that way. But the hope is that that pillar will help people to elevate data topics to the level of the management a little bit uh, in a, well, easier than in the past. On management, like really the digital uh, uh, well, we have a digital LT in, uh, in Niebuhr, so that's really where it needs to go. So data science, uh, of course, we have also a lot of uh, AI, real AI, but uh, just to say that uh, we, have, um, we have there um, a lot of things that are around uh, finding the path to value for our data. Okay, on the last pillar, well, actually there will be another one, but it's an extra one, is data enterprise. That one is interesting because I did not see that one coming. On them, when we created the data strategy, it became evident that we needed that one. Um, Niebuhr is a sub-part of Novartis, which is a, a huge system with a lot of parts and sub-parts. Of course, as a huge enterprise, we have central systems that exist. And for example, if I want to create a, a unique uh, universal locator or a URI, uh, well, why creating one in Niebuhr? Why not in Novartis? And of course, we are using the Novartis one now. So that's the kind of things that we can get from the central, uh, central thing. So, so what we said here is, if there is a, a system that is mature in the company, we reuse it. If the system is not mature, well, okay, so green light to go, but still, you need to make sure that you will contribute what you did to the central project, if any, or that you elevate the question to the central business. That one is really tricky. In a big company, it's, uh, believe me, it's, uh, it's tricky. Um, on them, well, there are other things in, the, in that thing, so like uh, a long-term commitment to the enterprise data management. So we have a central function for that now uh, with enterprise data owners, of course, like uh, any modern company now. And uh, the, the goal really is to leverage these people who are in charge and make sure that uh, we, we pass on to them these responsibilities that we should not do locally. Of course, you have to make sure that you have the proper EDOs, enterprise data, uh, data owners, to support your research topics. Because research is, um, in terms of data, pretty complex. We have a lot of things in different shapes, forms, with different uh, well, ways to be combined with other things. So you need the right people in these roles. And, um, and there also, it's, uh, well, it's not easy to find them, to be honest, to find good people for that kind of roles. Okay, on them, I would just finish on one that, uh, that I like. So here there is, uh, of course, governance about data licensing, but it's really attached to the last pillar, 
which is to adopt a common framework for data valuation. What does it mean? So I'm referring here to the, the datanomics. And, um, so basically the idea that our data should have a price tag. So why is that? Um, a few things. So if you look at the infonomics, so that's the title of the original book uh, that was written by someone from Gartner, don't remember his name. The argument was, okay, you are a data company, okay, so your data should be integrated into your stock price. Yes, of course. Yeah, it makes sense. And then you start to think about that. Okay, so I need to know what is the price of my data. Okay, so I know how much it costs to produce them. A lot of them are produced externally. I have the bill, easy. I know what is the price of many of the internal things because uh, I did create the value for, for example, the AMI collaborations where we put that as in kind. Okay. Now, is it really the value of my data? And the answer is no. You don't really care about how much was the cost of producing the data. You care about what it will be used for. So if it's useful for you, that has a value. If it costs billions, but you did not use at all the thing, it's trash, that's zero. That uh, maybe that will be useful one day. So that valuation framework, and we created two already in the company, is pretty hard actually, pretty hard to create. It has to take into account the, the price of the data production, certainly, or buying the data externally. It's a good way also to assess how much the licenses are good for us. Are we having a good deal when we buy a database from uh, colleagues who are in the, the, next, uh, the next room? Um, it's also, uh, well, one of the key questions is what is the value over time of my data? If I created some sequencing data 20 years ago, I'm not sure I would look at them. Maybe I would, but is it? So that valuation framework is quite complex. And uh, I would argue that it's pretty easy when you are late or in places that are already sold by some providers. When you are in the early research, it's extremely hard. So that one is one that will take some time, to be honest. Um, there are already in the company people who have been doing that in various places. But in research, we did not go deep. On, um, that's, uh, that's a, a complex one. Uh, there are some people in the room who have been dealing with that. So I know that, uh, well, there are a few people who contacted me about that pillar already. And uh, I will be interested to discuss that one, really. If we can get that one right, that could be a really very interesting thing for decision making. And again, when you think about verification, should I do it? Well, you want to know how much what will be the cost, but you want to know what is the return of investment, and it's probably part of that data thing. So that's enterprise. Uh, I expect this thing to be uh, present in all the companies, all the pharma companies, probably all the biotechs, uh, maybe better addressed by startups where the, the, the ecosystem is a, a little bit smaller. Uh, but I think that uh, well, there is plenty there that, uh, that you, you did recognize. I would just add the last one. I said before, I alluded to that, uh, a strategy if it's on paper is uh, not much actually. In a company uh, where you have uh, 100,000 uh, 100, people. Someone in a corner did create a few pages. It was endorsed by some people. If there is no action, it's useless. To make sure things will happen, we added uh, three lines uh, in there. So we have 20, 21 lines now. Um, one is that we assign uh, someone to create an implementation plan for that. And it went to the, the IT of, uh, of uh, Niebuhr. Um, we also ask for a reporting every six months to the head of Niebuhr on uh, the progresses. On them, we ask for an update every two years of that strategy. So, in, uh, so it's due in a little bit more than one year from now. And the question is, okay, well, what did we do? Is there things where we are just plain wrong, did not work? Is there things that we did not start? Well, okay, well, what's going on? Should we keep that? And I think these operational objectives are a big deal uh, because if you don't write that kind of things, again, uh, it's... Uh, can be very, um, very high level. So that's for the photo, for people taking photos. So that's the last one. Uh, you, will have a <laughs> you will have a QR code at the end where you can download the presentation, actually. So it's in ResearchGate if you are looking for it. And I believe that the conference will also post the, the slides uh, probably live. I don't know when, but uh, it's coming. OK, so that's for the overview. Just a few more slides to give you um, a little bit of what's going on. So I mentioned the implementation. So we are um, on our road. It's bumpy, of course. 
as expected. First thing is to identify what's going on. I also said before, well, we are not reinventing the wheel. Many things were in progress, in motion. And uh, here we tried just to, um, so that was for a reporting we did in May or June, uh, yeah, June. We tried to sum up the number of projects that are running on, each, on these categories. And you can see here that uh, we have uh, 50 projects uh, running, a lot of them uh, starting now. And uh, clearly, it's, uh, well, we have someone in charge, actually, of uh, dealing with that uh, data strategy uh, full-time, or nearly full-time. He's also the enterprise data owner for a part of the, the Niebuhr research. Um, on them, we, we reported that already to the leadership, so the LT of Niebuhr, the top, the, the management, but also to something that is called the Computational Science Council. And there, I would send you to the, the paper we published uh, two years ago now in... Uh, in PLOS, where we were expla explaining how we created a, a community in the drug discovery of uh, Niebuhr, how we got data scientists together to create these layers that you need between the people trying to do things and the management, which needs to have uh, one slide consolidated with bullet points. So we created a system in the middle, and I would send you to that reference, which is down there, if you want to explore that. So that's going to be a long journey. Again, things are happening. Um, I will not say that it's good or bad, it's just happening right now. Uh, it takes some time. And I, if I come back in two years, I'm sure that I will say that it's still running because we are there for a decade or more. But again, we see at least that we have enough star that we can align things. We are able to align also uh, people who are in charge. Uh, we have now a decent amount of people who are dealing with sub parts of that. So I, I'm confident that we did the right things and that is going to transform uh, the, the way we see the data at home at Niebuhr. Just wanted to highlight that uh, statement from our CEO also, so Vas. Um, so what he's saying here is that basically he's not naive about the hype cycle of, of AI. He knows it's uh, hype, but he really believes that being digital will get things done. It's going to be ultra hard. We are dealing with biology. It's a sparse, very sparse data matrix that we are looking at. We are far from understanding what we are doing, let's be clear, in terms of the biology, but still we will have some wins. It's because that guy is there that we started uh, all these efforts on data. That's where we had the big digital lighthouse. If you attended the, the Data42 talk uh, by Gabriel uh, before, it's really all that is linked to the, the CEO on the neighbor head. We decided to go ahead. And I'm saying the neighbor head for me, but we have other heads of the, the system. So what you need, of course, is to have top down, some people pushing. And I would argue that that data strategy, which is coming from uh, the, the management, is actually the other direction. So that's a push-pull system where we have all the levels actually in equilibrium, I hope, thinking about the same thing. And that's how you can succeed, I think, on a total data journey for a company. That's what I think. And on that one, I would just finish by uh, telling you that the slides are there. Is there any questions? I think we have a pair of microphones that are going to go around. Don't be shy. Uh, that slide was a mistake. They're taking photos instead of asking questions. Thanks for the talk. Um, quick question on the data culture part. You mentioned quite a lot about communication. Did you ever also investigate with respect to incentives as a part to drive data strategy? Yes, yeah, that's a good question. So incentive, how do I push people to do the right things? Uh, there are many, many levels in there. So the first thing are all the things that are governance, compliance and that, there is no question, full stop. So done, it's part of the corporate trainings. If you don't do the right things, to be honest, we can terminate your contract. So that's an easy one, but to be honest, it's part of the data culture. So that needs to be there. Then you have the parts that are soft, and that's where the goals are coming in. So the question is, how can I get people to be pushed to do the right things? Part of it is culture, like understanding that if I produce my data in a fair way, they can be reused by partners in other labs, and probably that will come back to me. I will hear about that, there will be synergies. So that's part of the, the culture. But a large part of that is to put some incentives uh, in front of that, yeah. And uh, the, the best we found are goals, 
right now. We had some hackathons also that uh, happened uh, to do some curation or some, uh, well, let's say some training on metadata because well, that's the purpose where there was also some crises in the company in the past. Uh, we tried um, gamification also. Uh, it's, it's an interesting topic. I think the, the best is to have a direct return of investment for people. And for that, their data must be used. And that's where we need to be smart when we invest. Because if you invest to curate, well, let's, let's speak fair play. Let's say that I'm going to, um, okay, so let's say I'm going to enter an essay in, a, in the system of Novartis. Um, if I look at uh, Pistoia Data Ferry, I heard, I don't know if it's true, but I heard that they have 200 fields now to describe the essays. I'm not sure it's true, but I, I believe that we had systems like that at Novartis. To be honest, I'm facing that. What is my incentive to enter 200 fields? That's not much. And specifically, if I enter whatever, and I have nothing back, no feedback loop, I will know that it was not used by anyone, and I will never do the work again. So I think the, what we need to do is really to focus on things that matters, that will be used, so that there is a feedback loop if we have quality issues, and then that works. And then on top of that, a little bit of goals, meaning education of the management, the middle management, and hopefully, uh, well, value creation. If you're in the center, if your data are pulled on this creating some new value, there you will see, you will realize the benefit. So that's where we are. We discussed many other ways of dealing with that, including the other way. So I, I spoke about goals on uh, incentive, well, good things for people who are doing it. We discussed also if it should be, a <laughs> if you are not doing it, probably counterproductive. That being said, at one point, well, <laughs> you have to discuss, uh, there must be some ways. I'm open to suggestions. Anything that could be legal, I would take. Hi, uh, my name is Karthik. Thank you very much for the talk. Here? Yeah? Where are you? Yeah. Hi. So, um, as the previous keynote speaker has said, um, since we're moving towards a very much more like collaborative environment, and uh, there's a lot of things that uh, smaller SMEs could learn. What would you suggest, like in terms of the framework that Novartis or NIBR is currently suggesting? What would you suggest that smaller companies or other companies would adopt from that? Uh, that's a very good question. So, um, the small companies, for many of them, are part of the ecosystem of uh, uh, biotech, pharma, meaning that, uh, well, for us, uh, well, we work together every day for many of the companies. Meaning that we already have things that, uh, that are adopted, it's mainly the data standards. And, um, and there are some places where we are missing them and where we are miserable, where we write some data transfer specs on, uh, on things, Excel pages to explain the data we want. So, so I think that world ecosystem has some, um, some data feeds that are already in place that can be better in some places. Uh, if I think about a, a smaller company, so what needs to be picked up, I think by inception, the first thing to pick up is really that concept of getting the fair play in place. And again, by that, I, I mean fair enough. You don't need to have everything to be fair. But if you have the right level of metadata on your data, and if you're able to locate your things, the APIs may be a killer, uh, well, an overkill. But at least if you, are, if you know what you have, where they are, and if they are documented, you are pretty far already. And on that one, I have an advice. Just create a search engine to find your data. If the search engine does not work, your data are not correct. As simple as that. And that's the first thing to do. If you do that, you create your search. So first thing, you see what is wrong. Second thing, to come back to the incentive, ah, I can find my data now. Maybe I will enter all the metadata. So that's, uh, that's probably one, the one thing I would do even in, at the beginning of a company. I would start there. The processes, of course, are a big deal, but I would start with that kind of things. For the data culture, that one, uh, well, I would start on day one, but I'm not sure how to start that. That's a very interesting <laughs> discussion to have because it's a, a very fluffy concept. But I would probably start with these two ones. On the rest, uh, well, if you start from scratch, you are probably going to buy some solutions from providers. They will have already a lot of the data management in place. You will have to deal with your code list, choose your ontologies if needed, but a lot of the things will come from the ecosystem that you are going to adopt. So that's, that's where I would start, I think. But again, that's, uh, well, I've been for too long now in, the, in big pharmaceutical companies to really speak to SMEs, to be honest. I'm a little bit uh, 
by us. Hi, yep. thanks. Uh, thanks also from my side for your uh, really interesting talk. Um, and when you first talked about adding a price tag to uh, your data, uh, that resonated very well and made a lot of sense. But then I was really wondering, can we really, as of now, define a price tag? Because, I mean, innovation can also happen in a few years and maybe in two years I know this data would have been so much more important um, to take a certain decision. So how can I now do a, a reliable uh, price tag uh, knowing already what my question of the future will be? Um, and I is it really worth to now exclude what I think might not be relevant uh, further down the road? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I think what we are looking at here is really a life cycle uh, of the pricing of data also. And by that I mean that, uh, well, I mentioned before, probably the price of your data is going to decrease over time, except if they attach themselves uh, to a, a conclusion that is uh, part of a project, a product that you will send to the market. And even there, probably with time, um, you know, once you're in the clinic, the preclinical part is a little bit less of a value. Except if you have some events, so what you just said, let's, let's say that I'm finding a strange adverse event in my clinical trials or worse than that on the market in the pharmacovigilance. What I'm going to do? I'm going to go back to all the data I have and here, if I'm unlucky enough to find the same pattern in my animals, in the early tox, in the GLP tox, <laughs> then I'm, wow, I have a real problem now because we should have seen that potentially and uh, well, something is happening. So. So as you said correctly, the data in the light of the context of what is around them could have a different value. And, uh, and again, that's, uh, that's a very fascinating uh, topic to discuss because the, um, well, part of the data, uh, data retention policies is going to be trashing data after a period of time in all the companies, uh, mostly to, uh, to get less storage cost because we are in the range of several uh, several petabytes in the hundred of petabytes on them, well, it, it has a cost. Um, I would like to have that valuation framework to be in place, maybe with a notion of risk, meaning, okay, well, it was, well, my valuation is that the, the price right, that, and right now is zero. Okay, let's say that, so I would probably trash it. But then, now, if I'm going into the concept of a net present value, like what we do for the compounds, so the, basically, a compound has its value now, which is probably zero until it's uh, accepted by uh, regulatory agents. Well, it's not zero, you can sell it, actually. But, um, but then I have the net present value, which is the expectations that I have on that compound. I know I'm going to sell for one billion for 10 years. The net present value is 10 billion. Could we get that for the data? Where, is, it, is it possible to get something that will tell me, well, in that scenario, this data would become reevaluable? And for example, the, well, I mentioned the safety because it's the first one that comes to mind. Uh, safety is a science of the past in terms of the data, meaning that you look at the data from the past. You get a new thing and you want to check if it matches anything that you have seen before. So, so that's an obvious one. But there is a long, long tail. And of course, when you innovate, when you have new data, a few years ago, when you were happy to get very noisy uh, single cell data, you were there, okay, well, well that's great, but then, uh, okay, what is the value of that now? Since the protocols were different, the machines were different, uh, it's hard to tell, probably not much. And uh, that's another concept that we discussed a lot in the omics world, for example. When do you trash things? What do you trash and when? And very often you will hear, well, if it's cells or animal models, we can redo it for a cheap price. Trash, it's less expensive and redo the thing. When you go to clinical trials, well, it's not the same business anymore. Uh, you can't recall people. Well, okay, in certain conditions, you can recall people to redo the experiment, but uh, it's not the same, uh, the same deal. Same if you have the, the samples in your fridge where you could recreate, assuming that you still have the consent for that also, which is yet another thing in the time of, of a clinical trial. You can lose the consent to sequence people. That means that I will not have the opportunity to do it again, meaning that maybe I should keep these sequences. But then do I keep the BAM files? Do I keep the raw things? Do I keep the VCF files? Um, do I like fast accuse? Well, that's, um, so I could tell you what we have chosen at Novartis on that specific uh, place. But to your point, yes, meaning that if today I put a price tag on data, the price tag could change tomorrow. If my compound, so I, if I have a whole package on the compound 
on them it's failing on phase three. Well, that's the kind of failure you can't come back, actually. Oh, okay, so we have seen a few companies doing it. Um, and I will not name companies, but uh, usually you, you, well, all the data that are associated are just to be trashed, except in a scenario where you are going to work again on that indication, that target, or that same structure. So do I trash it or not? So you are perfectly right uh, that valuation framework can work only if you apply it at a time where you need it. I'm going to sell an asset. For example, I have a compound in phase one, on uh, well, two, let's say, because phase one is not worth much. So I'm in phase two, so I have an efficacy. I've, I've proven that it's a compound that could work, but it's not aligned with the company. I do not have the people to sell that. Well, I'm going to sell it. What is the price of the, the, the data package? On same one, I'm going to buy it, of course. I would apply the same things. Excellent comment. All right, thank you so much. We're gonna have to continue this conversation uh, in the exhibit hall.